talking about in this presentation. Actually, we're going to focus on the space vehicles that the Soviet Union used in the space race. And in this presentation, you are going to see some things that many people have never seen before. And you're also going to learn some very interesting developments that took place in the Soviet space flights that took place in the 60s. So to accomplish all this, what we're going to do is do a quick overview of the U.S. and Soviet manned missions up until July of 1969, and that's when the first moon landing took place. Then we're going to talk about the Soviet manned spacecraft, and specifically there are three. There's the Vostok, which translated means east in uh, Russian, Voskhog, which means sunrise, Soyuz, which means union, and these are the three principal space uh, manned space uh, vehicles that the Soviet Union had during the space race. Then the most important thing uh, of this story is the uh, lunar landing um, booster that the Soviets were developing. It's called the N1, and we're going to talk about the manned, um, the, the lunar landing manned spacecraft that the N1 was going to launch to allow Russians to land on the moon. And then we're going to go over very briefly the N1 booster flight history. We'll end with a bit of a retrospective going back to April of 1961 when the U.S. was still trying to formulate how we are going to uh, get into the space race and if we should. And there's something very, very important that was mentioned by Werner von Braun in a memo back to Vice President uh, Johnson that was later given to President Kennedy. And you're going to see the relationship between what von Braun said in 1961 and how the entire space race developed. So let's start with an overview of the MAN programs. The U.S. space effort, we had six Mercury flights. Each one was a single astronaut. And uh, they were ballistic flights. Two were ballistic and four were orbital flights. Mercury paved the way to, for Gemini, and we had 10 Gemini flights. And in Gemini, we learned how to fly in space, and we learned how to practice techniques that we needed to learn how to perfect if we were going to do the lunar landing. And each Gemini had two astronauts. And then we had five Apollo flights. Each one had three astronauts. And some of these were prepar uh, uh, preparatory missions to allow Apollo 11 to actually land on the moon. And that took place in July of 69. Uh, looking at the entire Apollo program, uh, Apollo 17 was the sixth lunar landing that the US accomplished. And that was done in December of 72. While all this was going on, the Soviet Union had a space effort. They had six Vostok flights. And that was a single cosmonaut. They had two Vosk Hog flights, and that was either two or three cosmonauts. And we're going to go over all these in a little bit more detail. Very interesting things took place in here. And then we had four Soyuz uh, flights, and the Soyuz vehicle can take up to three cosmonauts, and that was through January of 69. President Kennedy said landing on the moon was not going to be easy, and it wasn't. Unfortunately, we had three... We had some tragic fatalities on both sides. We lost three cosmonaut, uh, astronauts in the Apollo 1 launch pad fire, and that was in January of 67. One cosmonaut actually died in an altitude chamber fire, and then they also lost one cosmonaut in the Soyuz 1 reentry failure that took place in April of 67. So these sacrifices were made during the uh, early part of the uh, space race. OK, let's take a look at the Soviet manned spacecraft. We'll talk about Vostok, Voskhog, and then Soyuz. The Vostok spacecraft, you can see a picture of it here. And it cons consists of a spherical descent module up here and then an equipment section down here. It, this all weighed about 10,000 pounds, about 8 feet in diameter. The descent module up here was for one cosmonaut, and they had provisions in that descent module to allow that cosmonaut to stay up in uh, orbit for 10 days. 
if in fact the retro rocket failed, the Vostok would naturally decay over a 10 day period and the cosmonaut would uh, come back to Earth, but he would be fully provisioned to stay up for 10 days. It's covered with ablative tiles. If you look at this, it looks kind of like a soccer ball, uh, but the tiles are a bit smaller. And then you have the equipment module that had the batteries, the thermal control. This is the retro rocket right in here, and it had the liquid propellants. And then these bottles along the side here, there's 12 high pressure bottles, 2200 PSI for oxygen and also uh, uh, nitrogen that was used in the cold gas thrusters that were used on this vehicle. And there were uh, five uh, primary and five backup thrusters, and each one generated about a pound of thrust, which was sufficient for what Vostok had to do. So looking at this in a little bit more detail, you can see here is the descent module right here. And you can see the umbilical that is going from the equipment section to the descent module. This is your equipment section. You can see the gas bottles that are ringing this interface. And you can see the antennas. These are command and control antennas, communication antennas, uh, and more down here. And these panels here are interesting because this is your thermal control system for the, the uh, space vehicle. Actually, these are louvered uh, panels that basically go like this, and they expose heat pipes which are underneath to allow them to radiate to deep space. And when they wanted to kind of warm things up a little bit, they would close those louvers, and the heat rate would be uh, decreased to, uh, to the right level. And you can see them over here. These are the louvered thermal control panels that they had on the, um, on the Vostok uh, spacecraft itself. So this is the uh, vehicle that they used for orbital flights, and they had um, um, a number of these put in orbit. The missions, six flights, and a single orbit up to five days, and that was the longest one. Gagarin flew the first... Uh, Vostok, and he was the first man in space. He flew one orbit, and the longest one was five days piloted by Baikovsky in Vostok 5. Some interesting historical and engineering points. I mentioned the 10-day provisioning on board. Now, all of the Vostok cosmonauts ejected from the descent module at about 23,000 feet, and that was by design because the impact velocity coming down under the parachute for that spherical descent module was too high for the safety of the cosmonaut who would be inside. So they ejected every one of the Vostok cosmonauts at about 27, uh, 23,000 feet. Now, G uh, Gagarin had a bit of an exciting trip because when he was coming in for reentry, this umbilical here did not detach from his descent module. So the equipment module was still connected to the descent module for a period of time, about 10, uh, 10 seconds, um, or 10 minutes versus 10 seconds it was supposed to separate. So if you think of tying two uh, tennis shoes together and throwing them up in the air, you will see them gyrate around each other, and that's exactly what was happening to Yuri Gagarin as his descent module and the equipment module were kind of going around each other during reentry. After 10 minutes, that uh, umbilical burned through, and then he successfully came uh, into the atmosphere. But he ejected at about 27,000 feet. The violence of the reentry, I think, um, motivated him to uh, leave a little bit early. Uh, so he did come down safely. He landed by his own parachute, and then the uh, descent module landed under its parachute. Uh, Titov, he went up in Vostok too, and the reports are that he was, quote, unwell for most of the 25-hour uh, mission. And uh, this was the first example of possibly motion sickness caused by weightless environment, and we kind of postulated this was going to happen, and some of our Astronauts also experienced a little bit of motion sickness uh, 
early on for other missions. Tereskova was the first woman in space, and she went up in Vostok uh, 6. So the, the interesting things about this was that, of course, the, uh, the uh, cosmonauts ejected from every one that came back. And here you can see a comparison. This is the Vostok right here. This is the upper stage. So here's your cosmonaut, here's his helmet, and here's the ejection seat right here, and he blows out this hatch right here and parachutes you down. By comparison, look at the size of our Mercury capsule, and then look at, that's his one astronaut, and look at the size of the Gemini vehicle with two astronauts. Here's the, the, uh, the part portion that returns to, to Earth. This is the retro rocket uh, module, and this is the service module back here. So you can see the size comparison of these three vehicles. Voskhog is the next vehicle that the Russians uh, used. And basically, it was an adaptation of the Vostok spacecraft. And it was actually a gap filler to bridge um, between Vostok and Soyuz, because Soyuz was delayed in its development efforts. So rather than have a big gap, they said, well, let's use the Vostok spacecraft, and let's do some really high visibility um, uh, accomplishments that we can boost the, uh, the image of the Russian program. So the, um, with the changes they made to the Vostok for Voskhog, it weighed about 12,000 pounds, uh, and it, it accommodated either two or three uh, cosmonauts. Um, they did include a backup retro rocket pack that increased the weight of the vehicle because a natural orbit decay was not possible because of the booster that they were using for the Voskhog. And um, Voskhog 2 carried a, de a deployable airlock, and I'll show you this uh, later, because in Voskhog 2, they had the first spacewalk that ever took place um, in orbit, and that was uh, uh, done for about 12 minutes. Uh, in this particular case, the cosmonauts always rode the descent module all the way to the ground. They did not eject as they did in Vostok. And the way the Russians uh, accommodated this is while it's under the parachute coming down, there was a retro rocket pack that fired just before impact to slow the rate of descent and allowed the landing to be more comfortable for the uh, cosmonauts coming back. But in this particular case, in both Voskhog 1 and 2, there was no emergency escape system. So that was kind of a risky situation for the cosmonauts. Voskhog 1, these are the missions. Um, Voskhog 1, they had three cosmonauts crammed inside that descent module. And there was so little room for the uh, cosmonauts that they, they, they did not even wear spacesuits. And there was no way for them to do an emergency ejection. And it was a one day mission, but here's the case where the Soviets got a propaganda first by saying, We are the first country to put three cosmonauts into space. The next big event that they wanted to do was Vostok 2, uh, which was the first spacewalk. So they claimed another propaganda victory here by doing the first spacewalk. So two cosmonauts were included inside the um, descent module. It was a one-day mission, and the spacewalk was 12 minutes, and it was done by Leonov. But in all the um, descriptions of what happened, you did not hear what exactly happened on that spacewalk. He, was, he, he went outside the, um, the airlock, and um, he did not have any hand thruster to, to control his attitude. So he went outside the airlock, and he simply drifted in space for 12 minutes. And then he had to get back into the airlock. And trying to do that in orbit on a weightless environment was extremely challenging because trying to pull on the umbilical, sometimes you go in different directions, and it's not very predictable where you're going to end up. So his return to the airlock was extremely stressful, and it was getting to the point where they had a problem. So he did get back to the airlock, but then his spacesuit had ballooned uh, 
to such an extent he could not get into the uh, entry port. So he actually had to go into his spacecraft, uh, his spacesuit, and vent gas out of the spacesuit to allow him to even fit back inside the airlock so he could get back inside the uh, descent module with the, uh, with the other cosmonaut. To top all this off, the Prime ret Retro Pack failed to fire on Vostok 2. So they had to go around for one more orbit, and they fired the backup Retro Pack, and that worked successfully. But they were uh, spending so much time getting organized for this that they fired the Retro late. So they ended up in the Ural Mountains, way beyond where they should have ended up, and it took the recovery crews two days to even find them in the mountains where they finally landed. But they did come back successfully, and all that you heard in the, in the media was that they had the first spacewalk by Leonov, and uh, it was a success. So this is the rest of the story of what happened in that spacewalk, but he had a very, very challenging time surviving the first spacewalk because he was drifting in space, and secondly, he couldn't get back in. So that was very, very challenging. And here's a comparison again. This is uh, Vostok, I mean Voshog uh, 1, and you can see the three cosmonauts here without spacesuits. Here's your backup retro pack. Here is the, re the retro rocket that was used on Vostok, and here's the backup retro pack. And then for Voshog 2, here's the airlock in its deployed configuration. At launch, this thing is all compressed down to about this height here, but then for the uh, spacewalk, they pressurize it, it balloons out with the hatch closed, then the cosmonauts are here, one cosmonaut will go inside this, close the hatch, open this hatch, and do the spacewalk. And here is where Leonov had his problem getting back in. He could not fit inside the passageway that was up here. When he did get back inside, he closed the hatch, they pressurized this again, he got back inside the descent module, then they jettisoned this, and they came back uh, in a normal reentry in the Voskog um, uh, vehicle. But they had to use the backup retro pack to come back because the main one failed. So this is two cosmonauts, three cosmonauts compared to Gemini, which is two astronauts. Now the Soyuz spacecraft uh, was the next uh, generation, and this was late, and that's why we had the uh, Vosk-Hog missions. It was kind of a gap filler uh, that the Russians used. This is the initial design. The first flight of Soyuz was piloted by one cosmonaut. It consists of a docking module right here, the orbital um, module is right here. It's also sometimes called the habitation module. It just gives the cosmonauts more room. This is your descent module right here, and then your instrument module is right back over here. Had deployable solar arrays to provide electrical power, and Soyuz 1 weighed about 14,000 pounds. So if you look more closely at how this vehicle evolved over time. Uh, this vehicle is still in use today. Um, and it has flown to the space stations and US astronauts have flown on board Soyuz spacecraft. But there's a lot of evolution that has taken place. Um, now it consists of the habitation module and then the descent module is right here. This is the equipment section once again, deployable solar arrays. And also, there's the capability to egress out of this area here to go into, like, the International Space Station. The first ones did not have that capability, but uh, the current ones do. So this is the Soyuz. Now let's take a look at some interesting things about the missions. Soyuz 1 was launched in April of 67, and the solar arrays failed to deploy. Before this flight, there was a list of 203 discrepancies that the engineering team had identified uh, with the Soyuz 1 design. 
but the higher authorities in Russia insisted that it be launched. In fact, they were going to plan a big orbital show and have Soyuz 1 go up one day, followed by Soyuz 2 the following day. Those two spacecraft were going to meet in orbit to help celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Russian Revolution, which was 1917. When the solar arrays panels failed to deploy, it set off a uh, cascading effect of failures, and he, cosmonaut Komarov had to make an emergency reentry. His attitude was unstable going into reentry, and coming out of uh, uh, reentry, the craft was spinning. It followed the parachutes, and he basically crashed uh, into the surface of the Earth uh, after the reentry. Um, so this was one of the losses, tragic losses of, of life in the, in the uh, space race. Um, Soyuz 3 through 5, uh, two or three cosmonauts, and these were Earth orbit missions through 15 January of 69. And they were followed by additional orbital missions uh, to support the Salyut orbital space station that the Soviet Union wanted to capitalize on. Like I said, this particular vehicle is still in use today. There have been design evolutions to adapt it to different missions, and uh, it's still the workhorse for the Soviet Union. Okay, let's take a look at the um, lunar landing space vehicles. Now, to land on the moon, you need a booster. And the Soviets were going to do exactly the same thing we were going to do, which was lunar orbit uh, rendezvous, which would have an orbiting craft around the moon, and another craft would detach from that, do the landing, and then it would come back, ascend, and do a rendezvous in lunar orbit. The cosmonaut would transfer back into the orbiting craft, and they would all come home. But their mission was basically two cosmonauts. So let's take a look at the booster and um, uh, some of the lunar landing spacecraft, and let's look into the flight history of the N-1. The Soviets have a big one. This is a photograph in 19 September of 68. It's taken by a Gambit reconnaissance satellite photo uh, that's been declassified. And when they saw this, they said, whoa, the Soviets have a big one. And this is the N1 booster on its pad. And here you can see the flame trenches right here. And here's the rotating tower that they used to service the vehicle. But this was the first eye-opening evidence that the Soviets had a moon rocket. This is looking at the tail end of it. And you can see it had 30 engines. Six were in this core. And then the outer ring had 24 engines. And I use this picture because I would like you to notice over here, these are people standing right next to the, uh, to the N1 booster. But this is the Block A engine arrangement. So basically, let's look at the, what the vehicle consisted of. And this is a model of it. Um, you can see a comparison with the Saturn V. Uh, the N1 had four stages versus our three. Uh, it's slightly uh, shorter than the Saturn V by about uh, 18, uh, 18 feet. Uh, 30 engines in the first stage versus five of our big um, uh, F1 engines. And the Russians used 30 engines for a couple of reasons. First of all, they always had a problem with combustion chamber instability. Uh, when they have a bigger combustion chamber, you tend to get swirling and eddies, which basically will destroy your engine. That's called combustion chamber instability. They never successfully addressed it, so what they would do is use a larger number of smaller engines. And also, they did not have the schedule uh, margin to allow them to develop an engine like the F1. And over history, they always have been doing this using a larger number of smaller engines. This is the R7 booster that launched Sputnik. And it's, it's an ICBM, but they used it for several reasons. 
And if you look at the tail end of it, you would conclude that's a lot of engines. But these are four combustion, uh, these are four nozzles, and there's one turbo pump. So this is basically one engine with four uh, uh, combustion chambers and nozzles. So this is one engine, two, three, four, five. And this is still um, used today in a bigger version to launch Soyuz into orbit. But that's basically what the Russians did to avoid the problem with large chamber instability. And just by comparison, the injector plate of an F1 engine is three feet in diameter. And there's ample room in there for combustion instability. And it took us years to develop the baffle design, which would eliminate the um, uh, combustion instability. Their vehicle used kerosene. It's called RP-1 and liquid oxygen. And we used that in our first stage. But in the upper stages, we used the cryogenic liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. Very energetic, very energetic propellants. So we were allowed fewer stages. The weight at liftoff, just about the same, 6.1, 6.2 million pounds. But the N1 generated 10.2 million pounds of thrust versus our 7.5 million pounds. OK, if you take the vehicle apart, the first stage is right here. And it's called Block A. There's your 30 engines. And what they did in here is they would throttle the thrust of the outer ring to do the attitude control of the engines. On a Saturn, we would gimbal the engine because there were five, and four of them had gimbals. So that's the way we would control the attitude of the rocket as it was ascending. The Russians did, want, did not want to use gimbals. They're more complicated. So they basically would throttle the thrust of the engines to make the vehicle uh, do um, attitude control. To control all this, they had something called CORD, K-O-R-D, which is, con in Russian, it's control of rocket engines. And it was a, a very complicated um, set of algorithms to throttle the engines and control the vehicle during ascent. And there's your 10.2 million pounds. If you look at the vehicle again, you can see over here they had grid fin stabilizers which are still used today. In fact, on the, um, on the SpaceX booster, uh, the Falcon 9, they use grid fins to bring the vehicle back. And we, we've also used these on several uh, military applications. Then you have a truss structure, and then you get into block B, which is the second stage. And this stage had eight uh, engines, again, burning kerosene and liquid oxygen. And the reason why they have this truss structure is because the Russians used hot staging. Rather than have ullage rockets in this stage to settle the propellants between the separation of this stage and the ignition of this stage, while the first stage is still generating thrust, they would ignite the second stage. And you had to have this truss structure to allow the exhaust gases to go out from the, the uh, vehicle while these engines are rap, uh, ramping up, and then the stage would separate, and this vehicle would continue the ascent. So this is the evidence of hot staging. We did not use this. If you look at the Saturn, um, we, would, we would separate the first stage, and then we would fi fire solid ullage rockets to settle the propellants in the bottom and then ignite the second stage. So there's a difference in design concept here between the, the two countries. So here's your hot staging, and the second stage generated 2.8 million pounds of thrust. The third stage, and this is kind of interesting too, this is block V, which is the third letter in the Russian alphabet. So um, it's pronounced V. It's not a V for five, but it's block V. Third stage, four engines, RP-1 uh, locks again. Hot staging again, 
You can see over here when stage two uh, is, is uh, complete, uh, they would uh, ignite stage three and the engine exhaust would be coming out of this area here while stage two is still burning and then they don't need all the rockets on the, uh, on the third stage. So the third stage would be up here and that is block V. Okay. So those are your first main stages that get you to Earth orbit. Now, we have to get to the business end of the N1. <clears throat> and the following, um, uh, we have what they call the L3 complex. Uh, this is the top of the third stage. And then all of this is what they need to get to the moon. Going from the bottom, we have block G with this is engine right here, which does the translunar injection. And this is their fourth stage, and we would do this with our third stage. Block D does the lunar orbit insertion and the LKD orbit. I'll talk to you more about the LK. Block E is in the LK lunar lander, and that does the landing and ascent back into orbit. And block I does the trans-Earth injection, and I'll tell you more about that. So you have the three stages down here, four, five, six, seven main engines. These are all part, all of these are part of the L3 complex. And this is what the L3 complex looks like. This shroud that's around the L3 complex is blown off. <laughs> and it exposes uh, the vehicles inside for the uh, rest of the lunar mission. The lunar orbiting craft is called the LOK, and it's part of L3, and it's a Soyuz 7K-L3. Uh, weighs about 21,000 pounds. It accommodates two cosmonauts. And you can see the components here. The, you, the habitation module is up here. Just like in Soyuz 1, this gives the cosmonauts more room to rattle around on orbit. The reentry module is right here. Very, very similar to Soyuz 1 and the early Soyuz. The equipment module is right in here, which has the life support and the uh, power and the uh, various other components needed to support the uh, cosmonauts on their lunar mission. And then the Block I engine is down here, which allows them to do the trans-Earth injection. Um, the landing cosmonaut, who is going to go into the landing craft, has to do an external spacewalk. He would exit the LOK from the habitation module, and he would spacewalk down the length of the vehicle until he came to the uh, LK lander. Um, this was never used for manned spaceflight. It was flown several times, um, especially in the N1 launches, but it was never flown with um, cosmonauts on board. This is the LK. This is their lunar landing craft. And uh, part of the L3 complex, it accommodates one cosmonaut. And here you can see the ladder going down to the lunar surface. Uh, there's the hatch right there. This is a viewing port. There's a window that he would look down so he can see where he's landing. This is the return stage right here that goes back up into lunar orbit to rendezvous with the LOK. And uh, the landing stage is right here, which uh, actually has the equipment to do the, the, the landing. Uh, it, this was never used for manned spaceflight, but it was flown three times in Earth orbit tests in November 70 and February and August of 1971, but it was never manned by a cosmonaut. They did the separation and the engine ignitions on orbit, and after these three flights, it was deemed ready for manned flight, but you're going to find out why that never happened. Now. The uh, lunar landing itself, like I said, the cosmonaut will uh, exit the habitation module, and he's going to go on a spacewalk outside the vehicle all the way down here until he gets the, to the LK. 
and there's the LK entry hatch. This uh, shroud is jettisoned before, but there's another shroud on the inside. So the poor cosmonaut, he has to exit the habitation module. He has to spacewalk all the way down. He has to open a hatch on the shroud, reach inside, open another hatch to the LK return module, and then close up all those hatches. And then he's ready to separate from the LOK to start his lunar landing mission. So this was not like with Apollo where the command module had an exit right at the nose and the, and the astronauts went through the command module into the lunar module and they closed the hatch up and then they separated very nicely. This is a lot more risky doing a, an EVA and coming back, uh, he, would, he, he would rendezvous with the LOK and then he would have to do a spacewalk again to the LOK, bringing the lunar samples with him to get it back into the habitation module so he can return. Now this over here is the docking plate. And if you look at this up here, there's a probe which would engage one of those holes. So there was not a precise uh, point where they had to, to latch. If that probe locked into any of those holes, they would be locked together. And that's what the plan was. And then with the two vehicles locked together, the cosmonaut that's in here would do the spacewalk to the LOK, and then they would jettison this and start using the block I engine to return to the Earth. So by comparison, look at what we have here with the LOK, and look at our com uh, Apollo Command and Service Module. Three astronauts, two cosmonauts, and this is the return part, and then this is our return part. The landers for two astronauts is the Apollo Lunar Module, and then here is the LK lander for one cosmonaut. That's the size comparison. So let's look at the N1 flight history. Uh, the first flight was in February of 69, and it was a failure. This is a photo of liftoff with the 30 engines, and then in flight, you can see everything is going well. The flight lasted 68.7 seconds, and then there was a pogo effect, which means that the pressure uh, um, going into the engines, there's an oscillation in the pressure that causes a very high frequency pogoing in this direction, and that did some damage to the fuel and oxidizer lines, and basically it was destroyed by ground command, but if you want to look for good news, the launch escape system, which is way at the top, did uh, take off the uh, descent module from the booster, and that successfully landed several kilometers away. But this first attempt at launching the N1 was a failure. The second one was even more spectacular. That was N1-5L that was launched in July of 69, a failure. Uh, there was a fuel pump problem about um, uh, 10 seconds into the flight. The cord, K-O-R-D, which I told you about, sensed that failure and started to shut down that outer ring of engines. And it successfully shut down all of those engines except number 18. So the vehicle is ascending off the pad. It gets to the height of the tower. It senses an engine has a problem. It shuts down all of these outer engines here except number 18. Also, these engines were shut down except number 18. So that number 18 pushes this over and it was at like a 45 degree, and then very well at the top of the tower, it basically crashed back onto the pad and exploded, and you can see what it did to the launch complex. Completely destroyed the launch complex, um, and they had two. This is um, pad 110 east, and they had pad 110 west also.
but 110 East was completely, completely destroyed. And some people say that the, this vehicle crashing back onto the pad was the largest non-nuclear explosion ever to take place on planet Earth when that, when that vehicle crashed back down to the pad. And, um, but not to be deterred, they did another launch on the 26th of June in 71, and that was a failure. This flight lasted 50 seconds. There was roll control problem, and then the truss uh, between block, this truss structure here failed. The vehicle started to buckle, and again, they had to destroy the vehicle by, um, by ground command. So this, the third flight was a failure. <clears throat> Last one uh, was 23 November of 72, and that mission was going to be a, a flyby mission. It actually had an LOK and an LK on board up here in the top of the L3 complex. This flight lasted for 100, 107 seconds, and at that point in time, this first stage was just about to separate from the second stage. But um, there was uh, an engine failure, uh, and the lines burst, the fuel ox lines uh, burst in the first stage. The first stage exploded about 10 seconds before staging, and the launch escape system way up on top here successfully pulled off the descent module, and the vehicle was destroyed by ground command. So this is flight four. It's N1-7L, and this was also a failure. It had a troubled development history. What's the story here? Why is the N1 so, so um, problem fraught? There are political environment impediments, and then I'll show you another char chart that has engineering environment impedi impediments. In the Soviet Union, there was no focused Soviet space program as we had with NASA, with a very clearly defined objective that JFK gave us in 61. They didn't have that. They were still trying to figure out what, what are we going to do with this. So there was no clear objective and no clear focus. Actually, their space program was under the control of the military, and it was assigned to artillery. And in that particular organization, the lunar landing was a very, very low priority, very reluctant resource allocation. And the main focus of these guys in the military, especially artillery, was to maintain nuclear weapon parity with the United States. That was their first funding priority was nuclear parity. Um, all the plans had to be authorized by Soviet leadership. And it took time to get that through the system. There were long delays. And the approval of the N1 development did not occur until 21, 24 September of 62. On top of all this, in 1966, Sergei Korolev died. And uh, for the longest time, they would not even release his name. He was referred to as the chief designer until his death, and then we learned that the chief designer was Sergei Korolev. Sergei Korolev designed this in the early days of the Soviet uh, uh, program, and also he was the main designer of the N1. But he died before the flights took place. Engineering environment impediments. They had low funding. Um, and that precluded the testing of that first stage. In the Saturn V, we tested the first stage on the ground in, uh, uh, in the States, and we basically tested the gimbling, the, ign the ignition sequence. We got all that ironed out, but they never did an all-up testing of the N1 first stage. So Korolev insisted on an all-up flight test. Take it take it to the pad, and let's launch it. He was that confident of it. Now, this cord engine control system was highly complex, and it also was at the limit of Soviet computer technology. So you're really pushing the limits of their capability. 
Inside the, uh, the design bureaus, there was a conflict between Korolev, who was a proponent of kerosene and LOX, and another designer, uh, uh, Glushko, who insisted on using hydrazine and ni 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 uh, nitrogen tetroxide. Korolev said, you don't want to use these because they are extremely toxic. And um, uh, Glushko had some uh, supporters. And then we had two design uh, approaches going neck and neck until finally Korolev got his approach approved because kerosene and LOX are not as toxic as hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide. There was a very aggressive schedule to the first flight of the N1. And then at the, uh, after the fourth failure, the program was suspended in 74, and it was canceled in 76, and no moon landing ever took place. So let's take a look at this retrospective. Let's go back to April of 61. This is when JFK, or President Kennedy, was still trying to decide about this uh, space program. At that point in time, Alan Shepard had already gone into space for 15 minutes and 22 seconds in, in, uh, on his, on his uh, first mission. And at that point, President Kennedy sent to Vice President Johnson a list of questions. And Johnson sent that list of questions to Werner von Braun. And this is a very telling response that he had. We have an excellent chance of beating the Soviet Union to a moon landing because to get there, we need a booster bigger than a factor of 10 than we currently have. We don't have this booster, and the Soviets don't have it either. However, we don't have to enter this race against hopeless odds of favoring the Soviet Union because that we both have to go and develop this huge booster, the Saturn V and the N1, if anybody is going to get to the moon. And in my opinion, the most, uh, most important way to do this is to uh, define um, a goal, the fewer the better. And he said, for example, let's land a man on the moon in 67 or 68. And this is what Werner sent to LBJ, and it got to President Kennedy. And lo and behold, we are going to go land a man on the moon, and we're going to do it by the end of the decade. So the rest of the story is history. Now you know the hardware that went into the Soviet Union's program. You know about the N1, the, uh, the engineering problems, the development problems, the management problems. And unfortunately, uh, that effort in the Soviet Union never proved uh, successful. But here is the evidence of what uh, we did in, on this side. Uh, six successful landings and explorations on the surface of our moon. And this simply attests to the dedicated efforts of over 400,000 men and women across the United States with a defined goal and with the uh, precise management uh, offered by, a, uh, by NASA to achieve that goal. But this is the accomplishment. Here's our lunar lander, and this is a rover vehicle right here. And this is probably uh, one of the J missions, which was um, 14, 15, 16, 17, Apollo. Uh, but they all had rovers. But uh, this is the rest of the story, and this is history now. The Soviets, when they knew they weren't going to the moon, they focused their attention on a manned space station, and they put their efforts there, and they had several, and then you know, the rest is history as to our cooperation with the joint Soyuz-Apollo mission that took place and, um, and the development of the International Space Station. So with this particular presentation, uh, I think we filled in some gaps into understanding Soviet space hardware and their approach in terms of building that hardware that differed from the approach that we used um, on the Saturn and our uh, lunar landing craft. And um, it's um, a, a credit to the extremely de dedicated efforts of these people that made this happen. And with that, I thank you for your time.
And um, I encourage you to take a look at the other videos too because with this particular one, you will have a complete understanding of the space race that took place between the, the United States and the Soviet Union. Thank you once again.